I relate it to like that feeling in dreams when you're flying really fast, but you don't have to put any effort into it. So there's a point in your dive called the free fall where you don't have to do much, but because you're at a certain depth where your lungs have shrunk so much, you're negatively buoyant. So you start sinking. And that moment you start sinking, you can stop swimming and just let like gravity take over a little bit. And then there's like gravity helps you move in the direction that you want to do. You don't have to do anything but equalize. Don Verhoeven. Thank hey, you for Zach, joining me on the you? podcast. Pleasure, man. How did I do with that pronunciation? Yeah, surprisingly well. Yeah, you must have had a really good teacher. So I actually, I lived in Maastricht for a month last year in the Netherlands. Um, my girlfriend was actually studying there, so I got to absorb some Dutch accents. Hopefully it translated a little bit. I love the Maastricht accent. It's really, really softly spoken there. Like the uh, farther north you go up in Holland, the uh, harsher the accent gets. Yeah, yeah. I So I don't really have anything to compare it to because I've, I've only I've lived in Maastricht for about five weeks and then I was in Amsterdam for a weekend and yeah. you know as most people are <laughs> that are <laughs> traveling through uh, mo most Americans at least they have that weekend Amsterdam study abroad story uh, that yeah. combines mushrooms and weed for uh, yeah but yeah I, I didn't really have anything to compare the accent to but I heard a lot of people saying things that I did not understand because I don't speak Dutch, but it, it sounded very awesome to me. Beautiful. I was listening. I like listening to languages that I don't understand because that's how you judge how much you like that language. Because once you understand it, it's not music anymore. But when you have no idea what's being said, it, it sounds and tempos. Yeah. And I have to say, I, I like Dutch a lot. Really? Oh, you're one of the few people who say that. To most yeah. people, it kind of sounds like a like a disease yeah. of the throat. You know, it's a bit phlegmy and a bit like. Oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I just assumed and everyone in. I just assumed everyone in the Netherlands had throat cancer, but it it was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. It was it was. Uh, <laughs> it, it, no, it did sound it. It did have a certain. It did have a certain musicality, musicality to it. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I live in Cornwall in the UK, and every once in a while we pick up Welsh radio, and Welsh mm. sounds surprisingly like Dutch, but like Dutch by speaking by somebody who doesn't really speak Dutch, who just make who's making up the Dutch language. So whenever I hear Welsh, I'm kind of going, "Is, is this my language? No, it's not my language. What are they <laughs> like?" It, I, I find it inherently very funny. Yeah. So what Welsh to Dutch is almost like Portuguese to Spanish, where every once in a while, like you'll you'll hear words, but it's an entirely different language. No, it like it, nothing, but they sound alike. But the, the, oh, they the sound words alike. Are okay, completely, completely different. But they sound they have similar like and like weird throaty sounds that you just don't have in English, but you have them in Dutch and you have them in Welsh and you have them in um, Hebrew. The Israeli language is, is yeah. like, there's a lot of going on there yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that, that was uh, that, one of. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you'd think that would make for like some good equalization exercises, but like the Dutch aren't especially yeah. good free divers. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is, what is the best language for? Equalization, by the way, and uh, by the way, I'm I'm here with uh, Don Verhoeven, who is a a free diver, a record holding free diver, and also uh, one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, cameraman in the free diving game. Um, the best language for free diving, I, uh, apparently, it must be Russian. Although, if you're female, it's either Slovenian or Italian, I guess. I mm. guess right now, but yeah, yeah. You'd think that that like your throat flexibility and like what you can do with your throat would help, and that would make me a great free diver. But like I've always been a mediocre free diver, so yeah. But I can do really weird things with my throat, like speak Dutch. 
Yeah. Well, you you say describe what you mean by mediocre because you are one of the you know most well known uh, free divers and, and people in uh, the media that either take videos or take photos of free divers. So, are you comparing? Are you saying mediocre compared to the global? record holders on the planet or because it it can't be mediocre to the average person because the average person can't really free dive at all or if they they have they would not be able to get to the level that you have uh quickly for most people yeah yeah that's an interesting philosophical question isn't it like um how do you compare yourself i think with like a small a small sport like free diving you you quickly enter a small pond and then like who is the biggest fish there like so you compare on a global Mm. standards so even when i did dutch national records 10 years ago it was still like have the world record so it always puts things in perspective doesn't it like okay that's i'm deep Mm. for a dutch guy but that's not deep at all for a freediver it's very mediocre but yeah compared to like your average joe it's what what I've done is inconceivable, but compared to like I think of Alexei or the the world record holders right now is that to me is inconceivable. So that, there's always mm. the next level, and I tend to measure by what's what's like the best, you know. So as, when I call myself a mediocre freediver, it's by the standards of William Trubridge and Alexei Nonsenov, the the world record mm-hmm. holding freedivers. Yeah. Well, well, I'm I'm just asking because I am a mediocre podcaster because I hear people having <laughs> conversations. I hear people having conversations all the time where I think, wow, you would be an amazing podcaster and you probably just have these sort of chats in the coffee shop with your friends and I'm overhearing it and it's the most entertaining thing I've I said that week. And then I go back to a podcast and I do all this preparation, research, coming up with topics, questions, things like that. And I come across people all the time that push me to be better conversationally, but free diving is the type of thing where you need to be in a certain setting, obviously. You need to be in some sort of water, and you can really see how people adapt to that. Yeah, and I think it's a very healthy thing to do as well. Like, you want to emulate the best examples that are out there. You know, you never want to strive for mediocrity, like not even when you are a beginner or something like you want to get better by by emulating the best and not by like mm. doing the same mistakes that that some somebody else is making, you know, like that way you, you're never going to you're gonna, never going to grow. So I mm. like I've always I've always looked at like who who's the best and what are they doing? How how did you initially get into freediving? What what drew you to wanting to do it uh, on your own, or not not on your own because you always need a <laughs> partner, but to to go out there and take take the risk of, of practicing freediving? What drew you to that first time? I think I was always one of those kids who was more underneath the surface at swimming lessons than on on the surface. Like I, as soon as I, I got over my fear of water, I was underwater constantly because that's where the freedom was, you know, that's where you could actually fly. And so to me, free diving, once I got over my fear of the sea was always a very natural thing. And then like growing up, I, I didn't know free diving was a sport. So then you kind of, you try competitive swimming, but that's really boring because it's at the surface and it's just laps and you get tired of that. But you kind of drift yeah. into scuba diving, you know? And scuba diving, I can totally see the appeal for most people. Like you're under, you're in that environment and there is that weightlessness, even though you have a, a big bulky thing on your back. But like there's, it's it's half the story. Like you're halfway there. But then on a scuba diving trip that I did in Egypt, we had a day where we were snorkeling and we were going, me and my friend were going so deep that somebody asked me, are you guys free divers? And I'd never heard that term. So we looked it up and like, we discovered like, okay, that's an actual sport and that's something you can do. Mm. 
And then I took like a basic freediving course, like a, how to hold your breath better. And just the information I got in that course was so, like that changed my mindset so much that I thought like, okay, yeah, this is something I can actually do. And this is something I want to, like, I, I instantly loved it. Like they, yeah. the reason I'd never free dive before, because I thought I was going to, you know, I was going to die because I ran out of oxygen. As soon as you learn like what is actually going on in your body, you're so like, there's so much more joy in swimming on the water that I, I like, I haven't been dry since. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned the comparison to scuba diving when you were first starting out. It, it sounds like we had a, a similar sort of transition into free diving. And, and by the way, I've I've only been free diving once a few months ago in Dahab. And when I say mm. transition to free diving, I just mean like the build up that I had to ultimately choosing free diving over scuba diving because I had the opportunity to go scuba diving in in Egypt in Dahab and my girlfriend mm. scuba dives and she was encouraging me to you know try something out and there was something inside me where I walked into the shop and I saw all the gear and <laughs> my my head my, my my brain went back to my experience playing college baseball a few years prior where I had some in, in, uh, some injuries and I was stuck inside an MRI machine and I had all this equipment around me and I felt kind of claustrophobic. And for some reason in my head, I thought if I have all this gear on me, it's going to feel like I'm being stuck. weighed down somehow or, or just like I, I didn't want to if I'm going underwater for the first time for an extended period, I wanted to just do it in a wetsuit with some goggles and that's what made me walk over to the free diving stand as opposed to the the scuba side of the shop and i met this lovely instructor arseny who's from russia and i ended up doing it for the first time in, in dahab and that that was my reasoning to try free diving over scuba that the equipment for whatever reason for me didn't seem as intriguing as going underwater for shorter periods of time, but just doing it more unrestricted. Yeah, exactly. And also when you scuba, like at a certain point, you get to a certain depth, you can't just swim back up. Like you go up a little, like five meters, and then you have to look at your watch to calculate, like how long do I have to stay here? And then you go up a little bit again. And it's like that whole decompression thing. It becomes very technical and very... To me, it never felt natural. Like the basic principle of scuba is breathing underwater. And that mm -hmm. is fundamentally weird. Like no other animal does mm. that. And, and the other animals also, they, they kind of look at you like, dude, <laughs> what are you doing? That's, that's weird. You know, you're losing yeah. a lot of bubbles there. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's something strange about that. I never got used to it. And as soon as I freed off, I instantly, it felt natural. Yeah, it's like a dolphin is going to come up to you and be like, "Dude, what are you doing breathing down here? This is this is not where you belong. You need to you need to get back up to the surface." <laughs> yeah, it's like, "What did you eat last night? What's with the bubbles?" <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look look at this poser. So, so from a young age, from a young age, you felt some sort of connection when you were underwater. Even if you when you didn't know that free diving was a sport, you always felt more natural in that element when you we would dive underwater and kind of explore around and hold your breath yeah i mean it started being i started being very afraid of water because like in holland they send you off to learn how to swim relatively early because most of the country is below sea level so we flood regularly so there's there's a benefit to learning how to swim like in as in you you survive things more easily so mm. it's very much a tradition in Holland to send kids to learn how to swim. And I was always that kid in the back of the road, not wanting to get in because I was really afraid, afraid of swimming pools and afraid of like lakes and everything and big bodies of water. I, I, I couldn't handle. It was just overwhelming. And then mm. my stepfather at a certain point, we were on a vacation and we had a, a swimming pool 
and he took me on his back and I trusted him so I could hold on to him. And then I had those little floaties. I remember them little yellow mm. floaties on my arms and he would just push off underwater and I, I remember that rush of water over your face. And it was it was so thrilling and it was so like it was like flying. And I yeah. remember like whenever I wanted to, I could just let go of him and my floaties would bring me back to the surface and it's like you pop back up. And just that sensation of flying on the water that instantly turned my my fear into a passion. Yeah. So ever since that moment but like that's the thing. Like I can still, I can still recall that fear, and I still kind of have it when I look at the ocean before I get in, because it's part of the excitement now. Like it's still a big body of water, and still something inside of me goes like, "There's an awful lot of potential there." But now I know that potential can go both ways. Like it has the potential to thrill, and it has the potential to, well, you know, in the worst case, kill. So, mm. yeah. But it 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 just turns everything up a notch, doesn't it? Hey guys, this is a quick reminder that the two best ways you can support the show are by one, leaving a rating and comment on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. This is like foreplay for the algorithm because it revs it up and makes our show appear higher in searches. And number two, you can subscribe to Auxoro Premium at auxoro.supercast.com where for five bucks a month you get bonus episodes and more exclusive content. Thank you for however you choose to support the show. It, uh, yeah, it, it, um, it, it seems like that's a common through line for people who end up doing something professionally for a living that they truly have a passion for and they truly have a purpose for. There's not always a linear connection between the starting point of free diving or doing stand up comedy or, uh, you know, mm. acting in a movie for the first time. Like, it's not. A clear I started here and then from there it just took off but everyone that I've spoken to that's doing something they love today there was always some sort of recognition of purpose earlier on in their life and then sometimes there's a period where that kind of drops away but then they always seem to come back to this feeling of oh I remember when I was a kid and I did this and it felt so natural where I was very curious about it. And then I kind of forgot about it. Or I was doing another job. But there's there's this like remembrance of purpose tied to early childhood. Is that fair to say for you? Like the, yeah, I that think kind that's of fair to say. going back to that feeling? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think there's always like when I speak to other people who do what they do for a living, it's something like they're passionate about. It's all. It's very often of uh, something also that um, they used to fear. Like for example, stand-up comedy, like speaking in front of an audience. That's most people find that petrifying. But that's you know that becomes part of the passion. I I I, I guess I reckon. And then there's another element um, that most people have is when you fi feel like you lose yourself in what you're doing, like you forget everything else and you kind of become the moment. Like you don't have any other thoughts and it, it like this flow state happens. I think people really love doing that as well. And I have that when I take photos on the water, like I, I don't really consciously know what I'm doing. I, I just, mm. I am and I, I, I do, but I don't think much. Yeah. So there's there's something something inside you, whether it's you know conscious or unconscious, that sort of takes over when you get underwater, and then that is what leads your curiosity or leads your practice of free diving. Um. Yeah, the pursuit of that state of being one with your action. They, I think they call that flow state. And it doesn't always happen. And sometimes mm. you're struggling and sometimes it's just hard. And sometimes your ears don't cooperate, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you forget to charge your batteries. You know, yeah. it doesn't always happen. But like on your best moments and your best um, sessions, you kind of tend to forget everything else. And you kind of forget time and you forget 
like grocery lists and all the nonsense that usually occupies your mind and you become be you become what you do rather than what you're thinking about it's really nice mm. yeah you you mentioned the the feeling of flying before and mm. i was going through a few free diving forums and some other podcasts that you've been on and, and some other just free diving podcasts in general and that feeling of flying seems to come up a lot and yeah. people used it to describe uh you know across almost all the conversations i listen to people the the word flying comes up at some point but it's not yeah. something that i would associate naturally with being underwater because you you think about being underwater and there's this this limit to how long you can stay under there there's obviously the the human body has its own limitations with how fast you can go the manner in which you have to swim or move underwater to get to a certain point and dive deeper could you go a little bit uh n no pun intended but deeper into deeper that feeling of flying um like what it what it exactly that feeling comes from you know emotionally physically mentally like what's going on in your body when you're experiencing that flying of free diving i think it's <clears throat> for me it's mostly a, a liberation of gravity you know on on land you're not so much aware of gravity because it's always there but like you get off uh, get up from a chair or you try and jump or you try and walk and like it's it's all a bit especially when you're, you're like a big guy like me gravity can tends to be a bit harsh you know if you start having aching yeah. knees gravity's a gravity's a bit of a bitch so yeah what are you you're uh you're six seven so you're below average height for the netherlands <laughs> something like that you're a short I, guy I'm, in the I'm, netherlands I'm, I'm a shorty in the netherlands i'm six four but i get still it's still far enough where I, like i when i get up sometimes i get a bit of vertigo so as soon as yeah. you get into the water that gravity gets lifted a bit and then you're kind of, because water is so much thicker than air and so much denser than air, it, I relate it to like that feeling in dreams when you're flying really fast, but you don't have to um, put any effort into it. So mm. there's a point in your dive called the free fall where you don't have to do much, but because you're at a certain depth where your lungs have shrunk so much, you're negatively buoyant so you start sinking mm. and that moment you start sinking you can stop swimming and just let like gravity take over a little bit and then there's like gravity helps you move in the direction that you want to do you don't have to do anything but equalize and as you're falling you can feel the water rushing by like your hands and by your face and it kind of feels like like i imagine air would feel like when you're going much faster so a free fall is like what a meter a second like it's it's barely walking pace yeah but because air uh, water is so much denser than air it feels much faster and you're moving without effort you don't have to do anything so that's that's the other thing like gravity is not as much a factor and that movement without effort, you know, like you're, that must be what flying is like, you know, you're, you're gliding. Uh, and yeah, yeah, that whole being liberated from, from the normal chains of, of terrestrial life. Like all of it, it's, it is, yeah. I know it's not like flying and I, I, like, I've never really experienced flying except for in an air airplane, but I've never jumped out of an airplane or anything. So it, it might be completely different, but it's very similar to what I experience in dreams when I'm flying, 
you know it's that yeah. effortlessness and and that freedom yeah it, it, it's you know it's interesting i've i've only you know i'll i only have one experience to compare it to in free diving going down to to 10 meters and doing it for that first time in the hob and i'm looking for some other places i'm based in new york for people listening or watching this so i'm i'm looking around for some other places where I may be able to do that regularly with a partner, but I did skydive seven or eight months before I went free diving and, and I didn't go deep enough or long enough, obviously, to feel that feeling of of flying where the the water, the, the gravity of water, the forces of water take over and, and you start mm. plummeting without actually starting to swim down. But I, I listened to a TED talk with Guillaume Neri, and he was describing his one of his record dives. I think I believe it was 127 meters, and the way that he was talking about falling down past that 30, 40, 50 meter point reminded me a little bit of my experience skydiving. Once you hit the terminal velocity, and it doesn't, you don't feel like you're falling anymore. That you don't get that stomach drop feeling of being in a roller coaster about four four to five seconds into skydiving there's this equalization that happens where the wind is blowing up as fast as you're going down and it doesn't feel like you're falling but you know you're going down and you feel this pressure and it's like you're in this really uh cool balance of the air flowing up but you rushing down against it and it feels like you're kind of just suspended but you're watching the earth rush towards your face and the way that Guillaume was describing that free fall feeling uh, reminded me a little bit about the 30 seconds of skydiving once you hit that terminal velocity point I, very different obviously and um you know I was not using any skills to uh skydive other than being strapped to a skilled person's uh having them strapped to my back but it, it there was some crossover yeah yeah there's 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 that there's also this sounds a bit weird but i used to really love i still love it but like swim um doing no fin dives so you don't have any fins on your feet and you rely on your hands and your feet to propel yourself down and back up and the the arm stroke in that is very similar to what a bird would do like you Mm. you make a big half half circle movement and that's one of those uh, one of those other moments where like it's just your limbs and the water and you really have to feel like how fast you can move through it and like you really have to kind of dance with the elements in order to propel yourself efficiently because if you go too fast like you're just wasting energy, but if you go too slow, you're not propelling yourself. So you have to find that balance of like, how do I grab, grip the water? And that's like, to me, that always feels like part of that flying dance as well. And I know it's not the same, but like, it it comes quite close, but you might be able to experience it in a pool as well. Mm. Like if you're in a pool and you do a good push off and then a nice arm stroke and you're balanced quite right, so you have enough weight on that you don't like instantly pop to the surface. You can get like yeah. 10 meters out of a, a good push off. And that's 10 meters of, to me, flying. So, yeah. It's, it's weird how we only associate flying with going through the air. Because if, if you look at people who are moving underwater and if you, you look at very skilled free divers like yourself, you're looking at someone who if you took that water away and you put a sky backdrop on it, it would look like flying. But because we're in a liquid substance, we don't associate that movement with the thing that birds do or, or the thing that skydivers do, even though mm. at least it's aesthetically, it does kind of have a similar sort of movement aspect to it and, and the way that you, you, your body moves through the air as opposed to water yeah but yeah exactly but i think most people have had flying dreams you know that like that dream where you 
you just kind of figure out the secret and you, you kind of take off. And it's always, to, I mean, in my dreams, at least, it's always effortless, effortless. Like you mm. don't have to do anything. And I think, because I'm inherently a little bit of a lazy person. So to me, anything that I, that requires no effort it, it is perfect. Like I like standing on escalators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I'm moving without having to put any effort into it. It's fantastic. You know, I really enjoy my car as well. But like in free diving, there is that there are those moments where you don't have to do anything and you're moving anyway. And you can kind of direct your where you're going by adjusting your body position or just adjusting your feet. Oh dude, it's so lovely. Yeah. I I have the same disposition towards laziness. If I can work hard towards something that will give me more free time and let me spend more energy doing the things that I can do in my free time, like hanging out, you know, just watching three episodes of succession in a row, like I'll work hard to get more of that free time. Like that's the extra incentive for me to not be uh like it, it doesn't always come from a place of oh i just need to work hard for the sake of working hard but it's more like i want to work hard so i can take it easy later and this working this mechanism will allow me to be more lazy later on yeah. that's how i approach pool training like if i know if I, I if i beast myself in a pool then depth will be easier or if i beast yeah. myself like at my morning workout and the rest of my my day will be a bit easier or you mm. know i can if i beast myself now then i can actually photograph vertical blue all the way through without yeah. breaking <laughs> you know, yeah you know but it, the idea it's always with the idea of like it it makes it it makes things easier later mm. yeah. in, in my in my pre stalking preparation for this conversation I listened to you talk a little bit about a period in your life where you were particularly isolated and it sounded like it was a period of four, maybe five years. And this was before the pandemic. And I, yeah. wa I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that isolation, kind of like what sparked it for you and to describe to people like how, how this period of I don't want to say loneliness because people aren't always lonely when they're alone. Those are two different things. But what sparked this period of isolation for you and being more solitary? Yeah. Um, my, my father died. And my father was, um, he was a philosopher and he was, um, like he was a pillar in my life in, in both in good ways and in bad ways. Like I, he was one of those people, like when he died, it was on the news in Holland because like he won important literary prizes and he was like Holland's greatest philosopher. Like they called him the deepest man in Holland. <laughs> so, and I grew up with yeah. a man like that. And so like my father, I realized quite early in life that he was, I mean, it's a big word, but he's, he was a genius. And I realized also pretty early in life that I wasn't a genius. You know, I, I tried reading his book and I uh, like his books and I, I, I couldn't, I tried at six, obviously I couldn't, but then at 12, yeah. I still couldn't. And at 18, I was still struggling. So I had one of those things where one of those relationships with him where I admired him a lot and I loved him a lot, but it's also like, it's natural for a young boy to, at a certain point, become bigger and stronger than his father. Right. Hmm. And I never got to that point. Of course I outgrew him by the time I was like 14, 15, I was bigger than him and I, like, I was stronger, of course, but like intellectually, like he set the, like he was my bar and every time i jumped i saw the bar like about a mile above me like th there was no way i could yeah. get to that point so i kind of grew up feeling like i was an evolutionary step backwards 
And that's not mm. his fault, but that's just a natural consequence of like how he was and how I am. Like, um, so when he when he died, I oh, that pillar kind of dropped away, and I had to take care of this legacy of like all his work. And I wasn't sure if I was capable of doing that because I, I could just about read it, but mm. maybe understand it a little, but not quite. So that sent me into, together with mourning him, that sent me into a bit of a, a downward spiral where I was feeling so shit that I thought, I don't want to impose my presence on other people. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't want to bring other people down with me. Yeah. So instead of like, in, like I kind of put myself in exile. So not mm. to be the downer in the conversation. So not to be, you know, which in retrospect might have been a stupid, stupid decision. But like at the time, I did it because I, I just, you know, I didn't didn't want to be that guy in the conversation. Yeah. It's like, oh, I miss my dad. So for about four years i was yeah slowly spiraling spiraling downwards um and the thing that got me out of that was free diving because i found um i found something that could get me out of that man, man, mindset i found something that was physically nice to do that required me to be physically healthier and then Slowly, I got mentally healthier as well. And then the weirdest mm. thing happened. So my, I went to um, a competition. It was my first depth competition. Mm. And I broke a Dutch national record depth. And somebody called me, the, hey, you're the deepest man in Holland now. And I was like, yeah. hang on a second. So that was the weird thing. Like my dad was the deepest man in Holland metaphysically, and I became the deepest man in Holland physically. And that, like that, that resonated in me. That's like, what, what is it? How come he's the deepest physically, how uh, metaphysically, me physically, what unites us? How come we both ended up somewhere deep? And then I realized, okay, I might not have his intellectual capacities and I might not be able, like his linguistic capacities, like I can't write like he can, but I do have his passion. Like he was, he worked at it very hard. It wasn't just talent. Like he was always working. He was always sitting behind this desk, which I'm sitting behind now. And I was like for the, for like a year and a half or two years before that record, I was every day in the pool mm. working at it, working at it, working at it because we had that passion, because we had that love. So I it kind of reconciled something in me like, okay, I feel very related to my father. And that is not just because I look like him, because we kind of do look alike and we have the same hands, but we also have a similar passion. And because I followed that passion, I ended up somewhere deep as well, you know? So, yeah, like the, 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 from the depth of depression, I kind of went to the depth of a lake in this case, or a depth of a sea, but I found my father or part of my father in it, in, in that depth as well. And that's weird because he couldn't swim at all. So, but I, you get to a certain depth and you realize, you realize something about that depth. And with depression, I realized, like, at the depth of depression, I thought I was alone. Mm. But that's nonsense. Like, that's something I told myself. Because in the depth of the sea, you realize that you are connected to the sea. Because you can only get to a deep point in the sea by surrendering to the ocean and by becoming kind of dissolving into the ocean relaxing into it completely and when you relax into it and dissolve into the ocean you kind of realize you are one with it and this might be hippie talk 
but once you realize that that is true, like part of you is salt water, like there's no denying it. Like you are 70% of you is salt water. Like you are elementally part of the ocean. Mm. Yeah. That's, and once you uh, feel uh, that connection and you realize that, sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say, um, it, that's a fascinating way to think about the relationship of depth with your father because it's such an easy thing that when you encounter the skills of another person whether it's someone in your family or a complete stranger and i do i do this too i always think about the difference between my skill level and the skill level of what someone else is doing in something that i have little to no experience practicing myself and yeah you mentioned the term genius with your dad and i'm curious to to see what is, what is your definition of genius because this is something that i've been thinking about recently like when when you talk about the level of your dad's genius is is that intellectual capacity is that performance in his field like what goes into that when you think about uh, the genius of your dad or someone else that's an interesting question i think i don't know many geniuses i've seen that spark in in only a few people but it tends to be a combination of things so like in the case of my father not only was he an original thinker but he could also read text in an original way. So he did an interpretation of uh, Plato's text in a way that mm. nobody has ever thought of before in like two and a half thousand years of people interpreting Plato. And then he could so also he wasn't write just reading about it. it. He, he, he was giving his own thoughts on the, te not just giving his own thoughts on certain problems that we're experiencing today, but he was kind of... Uh, flashing back his interpretation to other philosophers before him. Yeah, exactly. It's um because a lot of philosophy these days is knowing what other philosophers have said, which is philosophologically. That's a word. It's the knowledge. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, I just came up with it. There but you it's, go. It's, That's genius. You know, but having Having read Plato doesn't make you a Plato, you know, not even a little. Like, if you understand Heidegger, that's that's a major achievement, but that doesn't make you a Heidegger, you know. If you can get through Kant, then, but that doesn't make you Kant. Um, yeah. So in in my dad's case, like, he he had that trinity of things of like original thought, original reading, and being a very good writer as well so he could also express his original ideas about other original works in a in a in a very mm. good way so that's that is what qualifies him in my mind as a as a genius obviously i'm not objective at all but yeah yeah but it's 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 that kind of thing it's like an unusual a genius has an unusual combination of talents which they were probably worked really hard hard at mm. for a disproportionate amount of time. Yeah, I I mentioned the genius because what what you said has made me uh, just in this moment kind of think about how I interpret the the genius of others when I hear something or I see something, watch something, uh, whatever it is. I I have a feeling that the person is a genius, but I can never put into words why this piece of art is, or or this way of thinking is standing out to me so much more than other things that I've seen that have I've been similar to that or within the same vein. But this this person's work somehow is resonating with me in the way that I feel like it's a level above. And I recently started reading Walter Isaacson's biography on Da Vinci, and he spends the first, right, yeah, yeah he, he spends the first 
50, 60 pages talking a lot about the concept of genius and what made Leonardo da Vinci a crazy, or, or not a crazy genius, uh, but a creative genius. We're all crazy uh, in some way. But like what what makes someone like da Vinci a genius and not just saying it because you know i've said it so many times oh that person's a genius and someone be like why and i'm like i i don't know it's just it's just really good and (laughs) unique make make a really good cup of coffee exactly yeah and then the way walter isaacson explained it is that he took multiple uh multiple practices or or multiple fields and, and learned in depth how to do things that are seemingly unrelated to each other and then he was able to pair them into his work and and he's most well known for his paintings so one of the examples he gave was da vinci being obsessed with tearing apart the you know the 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 human body and and bodies of animals in things like autopsies or just like analyzing the actual flesh and bones and just everything from the bottom up of what made a human being or look like a human being what made a deer look like a deer and combining his understanding of things in anatomy and science to ultimately translate to the way people feel when they look at his paintings and walter isaacson really changed the way that i i think about genius because i always think like oh it's just because this person is really smart like their iq is high they're they're just like very they they make me feel dumb like if someone makes me feel dumb i'm like oh that person's uh a genius that's that's my own way of thinking about it yeah but there there's the the way of looking at it um in terms of someone like da vinci is that you're not necessarily the best in the world at what you do but you are combining things and becoming great at mixing things together that other people haven't been great at yet or maybe haven't even thought of to do yet and those things are meshing into this creation that you are bringing to the world somehow whether it's painting or philosophy and and when you mention your dad's uh trifecta like not only just philosophizing but also reading things in creative ways having interpretations things like that that sounds like something that walter isaacson would identify as yeah that's that's a that's the ingredient for genius you can't just be the best at what you want to be in this singular vacuum you're taking things from other fields and you're applying them into this combination this recipe that other people haven't done well yet or maybe haven't yeah. thought of yeah like for example yeah yeah like for example like if you want to really interpret like a text like plato's text like the the allegory of the cave or something not only yet you have to read the allegory of the cave but you should read it in the original language, which is ancient Greek. And then you should also know a little bit about like how that society was. So you should know some history. And then you should know probably other interpretations of that same text and how it has been interpreted through like the last two and a half thousand years. So like it, it becomes this whole complex thing that's we've woven in through many other fields and like if you just pick it apart and get one thread then that doesn't show you the whole carpet does it Mm. like you yeah so you need you need you need to go go at it from from very very many different sides and many different points of view of you and like very few people can do that like we tend to be like good at one thing or generally like mediocre at everything but like very few people are very good at like three or four things Hmm. yeah and then combining them into one thing and yeah that's something that's something along the lines of what you do with camera work 
in free diving, taking pictures and videos underwater because that's a relatively new occurrence. Photography hasn't been around for that long in the span of human history, maybe like 150 years, something like that. And now you're part of this 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 other this entirely different branch of photography which is we're going to take pictures we're going to take photos and videos in an entirely different medium and that is a combination of fields by itself and i saw the may the fourth shoot that you did the the star wars shoot and i I, uh, I was thinking yeah I i was thinking about you know you're taking photos of multiple free divers underwater so you're combining water photography pop culture which is star wars and you're making that into its own form of media and it's it's just like it's very inspiring creatively to see someone take a whole bunch of things and work it into one thing which is a photo or a series of photos but there's so much that goes into each element and then combining those things into something that people want to see and people find pleasing it's uh it's it's really cool what you do not just with that shoot but just your work in general it's very even though i don't understand all of the dynamics of free diving and, and i'm not an expert in free diving by any means it, it's it your work still resonates with me and millions of other people who follow you and it's it's such a cool thing to see come to life oh thanks Zach. i think the, the the stuff that i've done that has tended to be most popular is when i do exactly that i do something that people already recognize like star wars but you put it in an alien environment like an underwater environment and then so you take something familiar and you make it strange just by mm. putting it on the water so like i did one video where somebody has a cup of tea you know you can't mm. get more british than a cup of tea but you put yeah. it on the water and all of a sudden it gets this really weird kind of alien kind of funny effect so you know if you could if you start playing with that kind of stuff like people tend to tend to recognize that like yoga underwater like everybody has mm. seen yoga pictures but as soon as you put it on the water they kind of go like, what's going on here yeah you know you just add a, a different element to it and all of a sudden it's completely alien yeah so to me as someone who's viewing it someone someone who's in the audience i think if i had to put in words what was cool and and, you know really pleasing visually about looking at a photo like that it's taking something like yoga that is super relaxing or drinking tea this activity that is very meditative you're calm when you're doing it Uh, millions of people do it around the world it's something very familiar and then you throw it into a very extreme environment it's like those two extremes on the spectrum and that Mm moment in a photo those two things clashing together you're like this isn't supposed to be here but it's here and this person looks very relaxed doing it and it's just like you're 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 not really used to seeing people doing activities underwater and like this calm way especially without the assistance of oxygen like we all have those scenes in movies in our head where people are drowning underwater and and you know bad things happen people getting crushed by pressure you know submarines blowing up blowing shit up like so to see someone who's doing an activity that is not supposed to be there or like we haven't yet put there it's like a very cool dynamic like the the dynamic of extremes yeah when i think about it that's one of the elements of philosophy is like my dad says, philosophy is the art of looking at the same thing in a different way. So something that mm. you find familiar, try to think about it in an unfamiliar way. And that's kind of what I do, try to do with, like, not with all my pictures. Like with most of my pictures, I just kind of want to go, like, look pretty. But every once in a while, I have an idea where you kind of yeah. go, like, this is, yeah, you want to put the world upside down. You know, Star Wars on the water or like 
lotus position on the water upside down. Like it, it, it just flip things on its head for a second. And people tend to really like that. Yeah. Mm. Like all of a sudden they look at something familiar in a, in a new way. Yeah. So w- when you were in that darker, more isolated period after your dad passed away and you went back to free diving, h- how did you dig yourself out of that darkness? Like what was it an immediate thing that happened? Was the free diving taking over the mental depressive state where it was kind of a distraction like how did, how did you work your way out of that state um it was kind of a lifeline um i think at that time that was around 2004 my father died 2001 so in 2004 i finally like a friend of mine was kind enough to kind of realize that i'd been cooped up in my apartment for a couple of years and he said, let's go and like, let's go for to scuba somewhere. Let's go. Um, and we went to Egypt and we uh, did a, a scuba vacation there. And that was literally the first time I left for a vacation in three years. And mm. I left the house for more than a day in two years. Um, and we did that free dive there or what turned out to be a free dive. And then later... In that trip, we also, we snorkeled with dolphins. Mm. And that, man, that hit me. That hit me hard. Like, like I got out of the water and I had to, like, go away from the group and sit somewhere. And I just bawled. I I cried for, like, 15 or 20 minutes, just straight up crying. Like, that experience was so gorgeous. Was it the sounds? Was it was it do. seeing the dolphins? Like what what led to that emotional the emotional response? It was, it was it was the connection. Like after having felt so alone and so uh, disconnected from everything for for so long, then to all of a sudden connect with something like a dolphin, like they eye eye contact and like you could almost feel the empathy because I'm not a very good swimmer compared to a dolphin. So they kind of look at you and go like, are you okay? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Like, swim th- like that. Yeah. Like are this you, is an awkward need, dolphin. Do you need help? Yeah. This, this is a weird dolphin. I wonder if this guy <laughs> yeah, needs this, help. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> are, you, are you all right? Why, why so, is his blowhole on his face? Ex- it should be on the top of his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's in the wrong. <laughs> man, it's like you, <laughs> it's like, but, that experience was very loud. Like it resonated in my mind and I didn't know what to do with it other than it just told me like, you, you need to be in water. You this, like whatever you do with the rest of your life, make it about water. So then I started training freediving, but I also started training to be a swimming instructor because I thought like, okay, that's the most practical thing that I can think of, of like being, making a living in water. Mm. And I was kind of aiming towards being a swimming instructor for kids with disabilities. So I volunteered at this place where it, where they did that, like they taught kids with disabilities how to swim and like adults with like a fear of swimming, like they taught them how to swim. A bunch of ADD kids as well. It was quite mm. a lot of fun. But by that time, I was already so much getting involved so much in freediving as well that that kind of took over. But I think what got me out of the the depression eventually, because it took a couple of years, was that I was clever enough to recognize that freediving was a way out for me. So I took it seriously. So I trained seriously and I stopped smoking. That was a big step. Mm. And I started taking care of my diet. That was a big step. And then eventually, because like freediving you don't do by yourself, like you're most sociable as well. So that kind of got me out of the house a lot more. That's good for you. So it was that combination of things of like good diet, lots of exercise, more social interactions. And uh, yeah, years and years of trying to um, 
foster more healthy attitude mm. yeah yeah it's such a you know speaking of the the isolation but also being with people when you're free diving it's such a fascinating thing to watch because i'm used to watching with solo competitive sports i'm used to seeing crowds massive crowds of people watching tennis or golf things that you do alone but there's still an audience to see you and then when i've I've combed through free diving competitions. Yes, you're with people, a much smaller amount of people, but at any, you always get to that point where the support divers, if that's the the correct term, I'm I'm not sure what you safety call divers, it, people. Yeah. Safety divers, yes. Um, you always get to that point where you go much deeper than them, and you're alone and you're down there and you're just like yeah this is a, yeah. a team sport but like it's also very isolating like there's no sort of roar from the crowd when you go down to 100 meters and pull up the tag it's the darkest most quiet moment of the entire competition when you do the thing that is the most extreme when there's these millions of pounds of pressure you're being compressed you're at these incredible depths it's just complete silence and then you go back up and hopefully you know things go well from there and and you complete the dive but it's like this very weird but also cool dynamic of having other people there but also being isolated at the same time yeah i've called free diving the loneliest team sport there is because yeah, the only way way the only yeah the only way you can be down there is if you know that you have the support of the people up there mm. so like you need another person up there but once you you once you're down there you're you're all by yourself mm. and a lot of people find that find that very nice actually like it's a very like they find it nice to a, a point where they kind of want to free dive alone. And that's never a good idea. But there is an intimacy to it. It's like being by yourself with the sea. That's really nice. But I myself, I could never relax to the point of getting to that depth without knowing that there's somebody up there. Mm. And I also liked the, 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 the rope. Like there's, there's something that connects you to the surface and something that connects you to the other person up there. That like, it's almost a literal connection. Like when you turn and you grab the rope, you're holding the same rope as your body. And like, that's like you, you still feel connected to that. So there's yeah. a, almost a literal connection. So yeah, it is lonely down there. It's lonely, but like, there, yeah. Yeah, that's that that makes it that makes it interesting yeah you're someone who I, but there's always the idea yeah sorry no i was i was gonna say you're as someone who has so much experience capturing the visual aspect of free diving what do you think it is that would make more people in a mainstream sense interested in watching free diving competitions because the videos that i've watched i am so tapped into watching that person get to the depth and being able to do things that take you know crazy amount of skill and talent and, and discipline and even just watching people do static breath holds like i i think that's a yeah. I, like nothing is happening but i'm just i've found myself leading up to this conversation and and after i got back from egypt just kind of like watching free diving videos what what do you think it is that could launch free diving into something that maybe you could see on espn or something like a free diving competition that people would tune into much like ufc Mar martial arts was before 15 20 years ago was never really seen as something that could be a broad sweeping pay-per-view style competition that millions of people would pay to watch and then ufc kind of transformed that aspect where they made it into this this visual marvel do you th do you think that could happen in free diving yeah i think so um i've oft 
I've often hoped that something like DiveEye would, would come on the scene. And now it has. DiveEye is a camera that can follow the free diver all the way down and back up. It's kind of like a drone on a long wire mm. and it transmits live live images. Oh, wow. So that was step one, I think. Yeah, that's step one for um, for making free diving go more mainstream, that you can actually show what's going on. But what happens is, like say a person dives 100 meters, at 30 meters they stop swimming and they, they just start sinking. So then you get quite a static kind of image of a person just kind of falling. And you, mm. you see the rope markers going up, but that's all you kind of see happening. So it's it's kind of a static image and people tend to find that boring because it like i find it fascinating because i look at the little things that are going on like you look at the cheeks and how they're equalizing and you look at how they do like micro movements to reposition their body i find that beautiful but the general audience wouldn't be able to see that what i think it would need is a sort of a graphic in the background to show them like say they do 100 meters you take a building, a famous building that is 100 meters, and you show them like, okay, we're at like the 47th mm. floor now, and like we're like you show something in the background that shows in relation to like a landmark how deep they are going, because people don't understand what 100 meters is. I don't really understand what 100 meters is. I know it's fucking deep, but like, what is 100 meters? Yeah, people understand buildings okay so i you dive deeper than that building is high oh wow that's that's really deep or you know when you talk about distances like people swim more than 300 meters underwater what does that mean when you say oh but that's like six football fields mm. what <laughs> i don't know if it's six football fields I don't but um what always impresses people though is like when I tell people my wife can hold her breath for seven minutes, they go, no fucking way. Yeah. Seven minutes. It's like, yeah. Like that means something. Time, like minutes mean something to people. But a hundred meters deep, is, is that, that, that seems ridiculously deep. It's, it's too deep. Like five meters deep is, is, is like, that's the deepest pool they've ever seen. So like a hundred, like, that, that's too big a number. So I think you need a graphic in the background to show like that in like in relation to this famous building or like this famous like the statue of liberty we're here now yeah you know no, i th i think th there is something similar in terms of the visual th the way that people are visually drawn into something where people have to hold their breath there is some sort of crossover some similarity to what happens when you visually see people fight because I I can't look away if I see two people fighting in the street. Like that's something that I have to be like, mm -hmm. oh shit! Like, let me see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, this this person's yelling at this other person on the subway, which happens, you know, seven times a week. If you're mm -hmm. in New York City, you go on the subway, like you see some crazy shit, and every so often uh, there'll be a fight that happens. And as long as that fight is going on you like it, it's impossible to go on to walk up the stairs until you see the the culmination and the completion of the fight when i was sitting on the beach um in egypt this was before i tried free diving i was having a conversation with one other person and right in front of me there were two ladies doing breath holds and i couldn't look away like i couldn't pay attention to anything this person was saying to me because i kept looking over like when are they gonna pick their head up and then it, it like two it had to be two yeah. three minutes it had to be two three minutes in i'm like jesus christ like this this lady hasn't breathed yet <laughs> and then we and then we both started watching her and eventually i didn't have a, a the stopwatch on me but it must have been like five plus minutes and when you don't have a watch and you're just watching it feels like an, an eternity so we're both there sitting at staring at each other like oh my god this is you know this is fucking crazy like i can't believe you can do that like i i've known that people can do that i've seen it on television i've seen you know magicians do 
oxygen assisted kind of David like Blaine. uh david Blaine, yeah, yeah. yeah like do like the 25 minute mm. breath holds whatever but i've never seen someone put their face in person uh like just standing there 10 feet away watching them from a chair drinking beer just like watching this person hold their breath and they weren't even free diving so to me that is the element of something that could have potential as a sport could you sit in a chair drinking a beer and be captivated by that thing and for me i certainly was and the other people that were sitting on the beach were also like holy shit like she hasn't picked up her head yet and that's just holding on to the float before you know i'm I'm assuming later that day or, or before she was going down and doing actual dives yeah it's interesting i i had a very similar experience the first time i went to a free diving competition because one of the world record holders was there i was really lucky to see him um tom cedars and he was gonna go potentially for a world record there <laughs> And I remember him like, like, like turning around and then he lays down and you go like, okay, first minute, oh God, man, I'm watching a man doing nothing. This is really boring. And then after two minutes, you're going to go like, he's been doing nothing for a long time. This is really boring. Mm. And after three or four minutes, like you start empathizing. He's like, he, he, he's been, that's quite long. And then you start seeing like tiny little movements, like tiny little details, like, his ribs start contracting and his belly moves a little and like you see a little bit of tension in his neck and like at five minutes I was completely enraptured. It was fully like, oh my God, oh my God, what he go oh, he's still going. And at six minutes there was like a little bit of movement in his hand and it was the most thrilling thing. It's like it just like his finger moved. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, he moved his finger. Yeah. <laughs> and like at seven minutes, I was beside myself. It was, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he ended up doing like eight, eight something. And it was just incredible, incredible. Watching a man do nothing for eight minutes. Incredible. Yeah. It was super Time. Cool. So I, I guess it depends on how, how you direct it. That, yeah. That somebody can... That, that's if somebody can can empathize with that yeah i mean time plus nothingness plus the possibility of death <laughs> is super entertaining like pe like people <laughs> people sit around pe people do nothing all the time people you'll see someone just like sitting on a bench mm -hmm. seven minutes passes obviously it's not entertaining at all but if you see someone like standing on a wire 100 feet above the ground and they're just chilling there or someone that's holding their breath and it's mm -hmm. been five minutes and you're like is you know is this person gonna come up you know is this person gonna fall off the wire before you even get to the free diving portion of it that's it, it's hard to walk away from so i i do think there is something there where you can kind of tap in and like you said with the background when i when you said football fields like i instantly started thinking that would be really cool to have a green screen effect in the background where you have someone going down the field and it's like 40 yards 50 yards 60 yards like you have uh like overlays mm -hmm. of the other world record holders before the person like you can kind of put them side by side on the green screen and like have them go past each other and like all this visual stuff that you can do in the background to give people yeah. context because like it, it, the context i feel like will be uh an enhancement for the dive to make the average viewer that is just scrolling through channels see this thing and like everyone watches football basketball like sprinting whatever it is and then to have that combined with the free diving visuals in the background i think that could be a, a recipe for entertainment yeah i think so too and especially like on dive eye you can see the depth that they're currently at so that's broadcasted live as well it's like 78 79 you see that number getting deeper and deeper and they this is clever too they show the dive time so mm. like it's a minute 20 into the dive like one minute 40 into the dive that's three minutes something like that's that's quite clever so i the only thing i would add is that like a a landmark kind of thing to represent that depth and maybe 
like if you can something like a heartbeat that shows my dogs are attacking somebody oh the, um, there you go good, that shows good, uh, good for viewership heart is beating good for content you can look away from a yeah. dog attack so it's it's good for uh engagement yeah <laughs> Oh, I think they got the kittens. Oh, excellent. Oh, ripping arms off. Very oh, good. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Wow. Perfect. That's wow. that's a, a good submission move for sure. To, talking about uh, UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to go you, rip the arm but off. Then you can't, <laughs> but then you can't tap. Yeah, it's if, good choke if you get your arms ripped off, like how do you tap? You have to tap with your feet then. <laughs> exactly. Fuck tapping. Tapping is for pussies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> fight, to the, fight to the death. <laughs> that, that would be a, a good slogan yeah. for uh, UFC. Tappings for pussies. Come uh, come watch us in Vegas. <laughs> and you'll need to come up with a slogan for free diving. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the free diving version of UFC. Have, have something for that. Breathings for pussies. There you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's physically a weird thing to say yeah <laughs> oh yeah you breathe underwater <laughs> pussy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh i don't want to i don't want to dump on scuba divers it's a beautiful sport is there is there beef between it's scuba divers funny. and free divers like when you guys see each other after your respective dives, you ever look at the scuba divers and be like, oh, you're adorable. Like, look at your little oxygen tank. That's, <laughs> that's so, that's so cute. Um, there is, a, there, there is, and there isn't. I mean, I think there's a mutual respect. There's also like scuba divers always have this thing of like, Hey, but I can stay down there for half an hour. I can stay, you know, I can watch this thing for, this this many long. yeah but it's like i could stay on a plane and i could be thirty thousand I... feet in the air for for six hours and it's because i'm on a plane like i'm using a machine to do it so it's not like <laughs> it's not like that interesting yeah that's that but they can like when i'm working somewhere on a commercial shoot it's really nice to have a scuba cameramen there mm. as well because they can do things that i can't like they can like macro photography or they can like stay at 30 meters and like film something in a way that i couldn't mm. so it it's very complementary to each other but i think like it's i'm not sure if scuba is is really a sport you mm. know what i mean like it's it's a technical thing more yeah Whereas free diving is absolutely a sport. Like you have, like it's it's much more physical. So, like when you see most scuba divers, like after a dive, they sit there and they smoke a they smoke a cigarette and they like they have a beer and like it's it's a different type of person usually. But some people, like some scuba divers, are really excellent free divers as well, and some free divers love scuba diving as well. But like that there is a bit of beef in that like like we make fun of each other yeah yeah because like, they think that we don't see anything of what we're doing and we think that they are making bubbles in the water and yeah so the you know, the best part of scuba diving the, the best part of scuba diving is that it allows you to be underwater to capture the actual sport of free diving better <laughs> um and by the way i have no, no I, I have no uh sport of free diving better but yeah I, was gonna, I have no allegiance to free diving or scuba diving but i i just think it's funny that someone on either side will listen to this podcast and be like oh fuck scuba divers like fuck free diving <laughs> but um yeah, yeah. No, no they both have their their upsides and their downsides and their their advantages it, like my hats off to, to to scuba divers. Like there's technical things that they can do, and especially rebreathers and like decompression drivers that, whoa, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, insanely insanely skilled people. Yeah. So yeah. So we all love each other, but we yeah, do make fun go. of each other. <laughs> exactly. That's that's what it's about. You gotta show love by talking shit. Mm. It's the best form of love. Yeah. Bubble blowers. Um, yeah. 
So, you know, sp- spe- <laughs> speaking of the bubble blowers, something that I learned recently uh, is that in, in free diving, it's actually the buildup of CO2, not the lack of oxygen that causes the feeling for you to feel like you're struggling to breathe. Can you talk about encountering yeah. that CO2 buildup when you're free diving and how do you get more comfortable pushing past that like the the things that you do mentally and physically to get to a place where you can dive deeper and deeper into that that level of uncomfortability hmm. yeah um i can do that by telling you about a dream that i had as a child and then i had it again as an adult mm. And it was really interesting because as a child, it was a nightmare because I was in a canal in Holland. And, you know, canals are just like straight waterways with really steep sides. Yeah. And there was a boat a boat coming towards me and there was no way around it other than to go underneath. So I dove underneath it and I saw the boat coming over me. And it was about halfway over me and I started feeling my belly. I can started getting that feeling of like I'm running out of oxygen. I thought I'm not going to make it. This boat is not over me. I can't go up. I, there's nowhere I can go. I'm going to die. At which point I woke up and I was really scared. And then as an adult, I had the same dream. I was in a canal. Boat was coming towards me. It was the same boat even. I dive down. Boat comes over me. I feel my belly. I think, ah, first contraction, Mm. just CO2. Nice. And I enjoy the view of the boat going over me. I see the propellers going past and la, la, la. And I stay a little bit longer to enjoy the view. And then I let myself float up. So it's the same dream. But as a child, it was a nightmare. As an adult, because I had a little bit more information, it became a very beautiful and pleasant dream. Like it was a nice view to have. So the difference is that knowledge, Mm. the knowledge that that feeling you're feeling like what I thought I was, I'm running out of air. It's like, no, your, your CO2 is rising. That's all that it is. Like I've done tests on myself, like with an pulse uh, oximeter where like you get contractions, you get that weird feeling in your belly. And your saturation is still 95% or 96%, you know. So you know that there's still a lot of oxygen in your bloodstream. You know that there's a lot of oxygen even in your lungs, you know, because that doesn't disappear instantly. Mm. And all that that is, is CO2. You're building up CO2. And CO2 is uncomfortable, but that's all that that it is. Like it's a bit of discomfort. So as soon as you know that, you can learn how to relax into that feeling of discomfort. And if you train it a lot, you also you get desensitized to it more and more. So it doesn't get much easier, but you can hold the discomfort for much longer. And if you do that sensibly and with a buddy, so you do it safely, you can train it to a point where like you can be very comfortable on the water during dives for two minutes, Mm. two and a half minutes, maybe three minutes. Most people can like, it's, it's very doable, but you like, you have to do it sensibly. You have to build up to it slowly and you have to do it with a buddy. When you're training like that, does that initial feeling of feeling like you need to breathe, does that happen later and later with each dive or is it that it's happening at the same time every time you go down? So like, let's say like 30, 45 seconds in, but you just get used to pushing past that point for longer. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's the deal. I, I spoke to a lot of people also who, who can swim enormous distances underwater, like more than 200 meters. And they all say the same thing. Like it doesn't get easier but you can mm. hold the discomfort for longer. Mm. And it's the same with, with CO2. Like anatomically, like your physique doesn't change that much. You still 
like your basic metabolic rate is probably pretty much the same like you can slow it down a little bit but like at a certain point you're going to produce co2 at the pretty much at the same rate so those feelings are going to come pretty much at the same time but you know how to deal with them easier you know and mm. you know the more experience you have the more you know that it's just co2 and it's just like well, okay that's one of the signals you get it's the same as cold adaptation like the first time i went into a cold sea without a suit on i thought i was gonna die but like like <laughs> And now I can yeah. walk in there and I feel it's the same cold and it's still like fresh. But now I know like, oh, that it's just, it's, it's just cold. It's just a signal, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like, um, it, it sounds like you just, you get used to pushing past that point of discomfort, even though it doesn't become easier. You just, you adapt to getting to a certain level and then through training and then through practice and through repetitions, you can move more freely with that feeling of discomfort. It doesn't act as that initial barrier when you first started. You make it sound like a very active thing. It's, it's more passive than that. You learn how to relax mm. into discomfort. So you don't like fight it. No, quite mm. the opposite. You 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 give into it. You kind of let it, just let it be. Like mm. the, if, there's no point in fighting it. It's like fighting your fingernails growing. The, they're gonna grow. You know, you're gonna get CO two. It's gonna happen. Like <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's not that, but it's just not that big a deal. And when you realize that, you can also relax into it more. And that usually. Like that's how you get better as a free diver is you learn how to relax deeper, not just deeper mm. physically, but also like, like deeper mentally, like you, you start your dive more relaxed and that helps a lot. And that might help also a little bit with like getting contractions a bit later, but they're going to mm. happen. Like you're going to get like CO2 is going to happen. There's just like, it, that's just, and yeah. also the idea that like, it's actually helpful you know, like it chemically, it does things to your body that help you conserve oxygen. So not only is it, mm. it's not a discomforting thing. It's actually, it's CO2 helping you. You can, you can see it as that kind of a signal. It's like, oh, okay. Mm. My, my, my anatomy and my chemistry is going to help me conserve more oxygen now. It doesn't feel yeah. like that. It feels like you're fucking, <laughs> fucking running out of air. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. what actually is happening is different. Yeah, I'm just imagining some guy strangling another person on the street and be like, "I'm act I'm helping you relax." Like just <laughs> just just accept it. Just accept just accept it. Like like you like you go to a like you go to a spa, you go you go to a spa and you pay $200 for a relaxation package and you're expecting it you're expecting it to be sauna massage and it's no it's just like some big russian dude comes and chokes you out and he's just like go with it. Accept it. Go with it. Accept yeah. accept accept what I am doing to you. Accept, <laughs> accept the embrace. The, the the difference being obviously that strangulation cuts off your blood supply. Yeah. You know which yeah. is different from stopping breathing. But yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Is there a way to put into words what you have queued up in your mind and in your body to get to that deeper state of relaxation? Like if you're on a dive and you sense that your relaxation just went from 50% relaxed to 75% relaxed. What is happening in your mm -hmm. mind and body when you feel those contractions when the CO2 is building up to relax more and more into the discomfort, like that passive relaxation you mentioned? Two words. Let go. Just let it go. Let go. That's what's going on in my mind. Like, let go. Like, if you feel tension, let let go. It's mm. um, 
because a lot of people think of relaxation as something very mental or like spiritual even whereas i think of relaxation as something very physical and it's it's giving into gravity like you're falling like you're you just let let go you let your arms float wherever it wants to float you let your mm. neck float however like whatever position your body ends up being in that's fine you know we often carry tension in our bellies because like we want to like suck them in and like be straight and everything look if you let that look go good for okay, those underwater you're gonna, photos you're gonna exactly let go just like yeah. let let your belly stick out let it let it be if you have to like, like if you feel a fart build up let it go let go you know it's it's give in to gravity whatever gravity wants to do with you let it happen it's it's fine so it's a very yeah. to me it's a very physical thing so that's what i'm thinking but i'm breathing up on on a line like there's usually there's usually a bit of chop here in cornwall there's like we drive in the atlantic so it's it's a lively ocean and you just kind of you go with with the waves and you let you let the water carry you like that's you don't have to carry yourself anymore that's the lovely thing like the water is carrying you so mm. you can let go yeah there's this meditation app that i like to use it's called the waking up by sam harris and mm. one of the cues that helps me let go in a meditation or just in day-to-day -day life is the words drop everything he'll often use that throughout the meditations you know just like drop everything whatever's going on the emails that you have to send later today the to-do list that you have in your head the workout that you know is coming up in an hour or two whenever it is just like drop everything and be here right now and yeah if there is a sort of gravity in everyday life it's the it's the gravity of the future like the 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 anxiousness of the the future uh i mean i'm just talking personal experience like obviously the the past has its own gravity but the future is like sometimes you pull the future towards you before it actually gets there so you feel this pressure that's just only happening in your mind but it's not actually mm. happening yet you're just you're you're giving it more power than it actually has and mm. when you're talking about the the letting go you know obviously that that's life and death you know if i if i don't let go during a meditation i just may be more pissed off or anxious or reactionary that day i'm not gonna die because i don't let go that's that's just uh it, it's uh, uh not comparing the two at all but it's it is this kind of uh like the the relaxing state that what i've realized that when i am the most relaxed in everyday life it's that drop everything let go cue that often brings me to that state like I, I and i agree with you wholeheartedly about meditation and the, that act of being present being less spiritual and more practical because when i when i think of dropping everything to me that means when i'm having a conversation with my brother or my girlfriend and i see that text pop up on my phone the drop everything is okay just let my phone go dark and I'll deal with this in 15 minutes. Whereas other times I just like have that initial, like whatever that external pressure is, I just need to grab it and pull it towards me to deal with it now and kind of give that thing power. Mm. But the, the dropping everything is what to, to me, that's like the, the non-spiritual, just more, in the moment can you drop it like can you truly drop this and focus on the moment Do, are you or are you adding the extra pressure into your life that isn't actually yeah. there yet do you find that um it's kind of linked to your curiosity as well 
Should I explain that a bit the, more? Yeah, but what do you mean by being linked to curiosity? Do you mean the drive to look at something like a text, or or do you mean the dropping no, everything? The, the which, being, which spectrum? Yeah, the dropping and it. Yeah, the dropping everything. Like the yeah. For me, the being in the moment sometimes has to do with being curious about what what's going to happen now. You know, not so mm. much like what do I want to happen, but what is actually happening, you know, and just kind of be a passive observer of the moment because you're curious to see like, you know, like the fight on the end train. <laughs> like, yes. W- yeah. What's going to happen? What's going to what's going to happen now? Yeah. No, you know, curiosity. Kind of like Curiosity for me is definitely a huge part of that because within podcasting, I started out solely having conversations with music artists or people in the music industry. And I had amazing Mm. conversations. I still talk to music artists, but I found myself becoming less and less present during conversations. And I believe that's because I was more omni-curious than the music box of podcasting was allowing me to express. So I just kind of let go of the music label. And I decided that as I go through life, the people that I encounter or the work of others that I encounter, I'm just going to reach out to those who I'm the most curious about, like yourself. Mm. When I started going through your YouTube channel and started learning more about free diving, I knew I, you know, I don't have an expertise. I'm not uh, in any way someone I would consider knowledgeable on the subject, but I had a deep curiosity for talking to someone who's been in that state and who has done thousands of reps in that state and combines Mm -hmm. that with media, puts out all this cool work. And that curiosity makes me kind of like, it's not enough to keep me present for long periods of time, but it is this sort of on and off switch of like, I don't think true presence can be there without the initial curiosity. But then there also is the other side of it, which is I believe that you can practice becoming more curious when you become, when when you allow yourself to have spaces throughout the day where you let your mind roam and explore and kind of drop into that flow state that every time you do that, you're training your mind to observe the thing that you haven't observed in the past like the feeling of wind in your fingers when you walk or you know the fact that you could see things in front of objects like the little like like the dust particles in space like sometimes when i'm staring at meditation i like look at the space in front of the object so i I think it's for me it's like a double-sided thing where the curiosity needs to be there for me to be present, but then also you can learn to become more curious over time for me at least. Yeah. 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 I agree. I, I often have this one, like I have an idea to film something. I have to be very careful not to fill in the blanks too much, you know, like to let reality shape it when we're filming it. So mm-hmm. I have a script and I have an idea and I have certain elements in place, but I like to be surprised by how it actually becomes. And you have to mm-hmm. be like you have to be mindful of the fact that it it becomes its own thing and it it will be what it want kind of what it wants to be. Like the mm-hmm. idea will sometimes we can become something completely different. So like I I always compare working on the water to like being the opposite to working in a studio like in a studio you can kind of mm. control everything and you can really be dic- almost dictatorial about like where you want things to be and how you want the light to be whereas in the water like everything moves and you've you've got no grip on anything and that for me is part of the part of the charm of it as well like it like when i go into into a shoot i'm 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 genuinely curious to see what like, what, what will happen because sometimes also you yeah. have an idea that is so extreme and so out there that you're kind of curious, like, can we actually do this? You know? And when I have an idea like that, I, I ask my friend Stieg and, and he tends to be able to do it. But like, yeah. 
Hmm. Is this uh, interesting out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say with, with all this, with all this talk about mindfulness and curiosity, I I have to ask you: Have you ever taken a large dose of psychedelics like mushrooms, LSD, <laughs> anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mushrooms. Um, yeah. Do you very, feel like there's any sort of? Very... Do you, do you feel like there's any sort of connections with being on mushrooms and being underwater? Like I've, you know, I've only done uh, what would be considered micro doses of mushrooms. Like I, I have not gone, you know, full psychonaut yet, whether it's anxiety or like whatever's holding me back. But I have experienced it somewhat. But when, when I've seen your photos and videos underwater, um, you know, that small slice of other realities that I've had through lower doses of psychedelics, like it kind of made me think about, you know, is there any connection with what a five gram dose of mushroom would be like? And then also the experience of being underwater and like seeing the light come through the, the waves and the temperature and like the waviness of it. Like, have have you ever connected those two experiences in your head somewhat even if it's only a partial connection yeah that's a partial connection i've like i've done shrooms and laid on the floor and watched the clouds and 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 see how alive they are or you stare at like a piece of art and and you feel that it is alive and i've laid on the the bottom of the sea and stared at like the surface or stared at the seaweeds moving and everything. And it, it's a little bit similar. I was once laying on the floor, but I had my, like on the bottom of the ocean at like 18 meters or something, like 60 feet. And I was just laying there with my eyes closed. Just because I like that sensation of being a little bit rocked by the sea at, yeah. at, at depth. And uh, I kind of had the feeling of like being watched. So I opened my eyes and this this big blue fish was looking at me. And it looked so tropical that I thought I was tripping. Because I I'd never seen a blue fish in these waters here. Like these are green Atlantic waters, and usually the fish are kind of brownish or like, you mm. know, that kind of stuff. And this one looked tropical, blue, intensely blue, almost like ultramarine blue. Yeah. So I thought, fuck, am, am I tripping? Am I do I have narcosis? Do I have a, a, a flashback? What's going on here? So yeah. I kind of giggled and I swam, swam back to the surface. And I told my buddy, it's like, I think I'm tripping because I saw a blue fish down there. And she went, oh, no, no, that's a cuckoo-ress. Like, apparently there's a, a fish around here that is intensely, intensely blue. Oh, wow. But I just never heard of it before. So it's like, oh, okay, that explains it. Like, I wasn't tripping. But um, so, yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's... um. It's it's interesting. Underwater, you you get into a bit of a different state. It's a different element, and your body seems to respond to it by by changing its chemistry as well. You, yeah, there's something. The world becomes literally more fluid, and, and you get that yeah. on shrooms as well. Like shit becomes fluid. Yeah. Well, you've you've spent, you know, what what I imagine is hundreds even even thousands of hours at this point in that fluid state underwater encountering other animals like fish dolphins uh whales is there do you get a sense that the the mammals uh the other species that you've seen underwater like there's a form of consciousness that may be just as high as humans but it's just different. Like when you encounter dolphins or something like that, like a level of emotional intelligence. Cause I've heard people talk about other animals that they've encountered underwater. And there's like this sense that there's an emotional communication happening between two beings, like two dolphins that seems like there's a lot of intelligence there, but it's just not our language. Like they're doing it in a way that is complex and meaningful 
but it's not mm. it's like it's not english like they're, they're they're you know they're they're on some other plane do you ever get that feeling or have you been like nah like it's they're just you know it's whatever they're just you know animal talking no 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 i i very strongly get that feeling i what you're saying makes me think of two things the first was when i was i think 17 or 18 i was scuba diving and an octopus came and he came up to us and like i'm i I was at that age already very much taught like you don't touch anything but it started touching me Mm. so then you know all bets are off so it was kind of like wrapping itself around my hand and exploring me and like and i was just looking at it and you could tell like by the way it moved and by by its colors that like it was all right everything was right and it was an interesting feeling you know it was much more muscular than i thought it was going to be not slimy at all and then all of a sudden like i didn't do anything but it changed color it it turned white and i realized like okay it's had enough so i opened my hand and it just and it swam away and then all of a sudden i i kind of went like did it just talk to me in color <laughs> like it yeah like the, the something about that color change made me realize okay he wants to go so it talked to me but not in in an, in a very conventional way and then the second thing is years later i i read something that blew my mind the hypothesis of dolphin language or cetacean language is mm. because they have sonar like we use the word tree and i say a tree and you picture a tree in your mind right like that's how our language works like you know what a tree is but they mm. they suspect that cetacean language is so that they use sonar to describe not describe they they make a pitch they can project a picture of a tree to the other person in sonar or to the other dolphin wow. so they make the sound of like a sound picture of a tree or like in their case like an anemone or something so it's a very specific thing like they don't have the the abstraction of a tree but they kind of go like you know this anemone <laughs> right here or like this many fish not just a fish but like that fish they can make that sound yeah and like project a sound image which is like that blew my mind if your brain can do that because you can make so you can make an image in sound and have it be very specific and you can Mm. transmit it and receive it so what i'm thinking is like their form of communication is so much more evolved or so much more specific than ours is that like I, I don't think our brains can kind of wrap, wrap themselves around the complexity yeah. of their language yet. There's a lot to be learned there. But that they are speaking and that they have culture and like and that they are teaching each other things. That that's for sure. Like that's that's been proven. Yeah. You know? No, it's it's crazy to think about because we're so land centric and we're used to sounds being very sharp and different from one another clear pauses you know it's like there's this very Mm. uh like clear it sounds the way that human mouths create it sounds just very like clear and separated the words are this is this and this and this but then as soon as we go underwater the only way that we can really communicate is you you know you go underwater and you see your friend and you immediately go to like these hand signals these signs these so if you're if you're a species that's evolved over millions of years it makes sense that you would have these levels of communication that seem so alien to us underwater because we just don't have the same restrictions and maybe instead of words the sound tree creating a sound these sound waves enter the brain of some something like a dolphin and there's this picture that's painted based on the frequency where it's like oh this is this is uh go left or this is you know 
uh, we're by land soon. Wh- whatever it is, they, like this is fuck off. Like to a dolphin, like can dolphins tell each other, like f- like <laughs> you know, you're a piece of shit, or I want to have sex, or all this yeah. stuff, just with yeah. motion underwater and things that s- just sound like sounds to us. Like we're so I- used to hearing animals yeah. groan, and we're like, this is just a very primal, low level form of communication. But what if those sounds yeah. are painting super vivid? imagery and, and complex thoughts and things like that yeah i've definitely been taught to fuck off by a seal <laughs> like when a seal tells you to fuck off you fuck off it's like bah! <laughs> they bark at you and they do this <laughs> and you kind of go like, oh okay. yeah. <laughs> i'm out of here because <laughs> especially like a, a male a bull seal oh. <laughs> When they yeah. tell you to fuck off, you fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you win. I'm out of here. <laughs> Bye-bye. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's there's no miscommunication there. Yeah. So mm. I uh, I wanted to bring up a quote from your father, Cornelius Verhoeven. And... Hey. The, you know the great Dutch philosopher he went he went deep in philosophy you went deep in water and you know we'll I'm, I'm gonna try to uh, bring those two together and uh, not stumble over myself when I ask you this but your your father said this uh, Cornelius Verhoeven quote when you endeavor something and you work very hard at it it sometimes happens where it works out in such a way that it surprises you and you wonder, did I do that? And so I wanted to ask you, is, is there something in free diving, whether it's been a physical feat that you've accomplished as a free diver or a photo you've taken, has there ever been a moment where you, you think back to it or you look at it and you think, holy shit, did I do that? Like that element of surprise that you did something that you can't really believe that you've accomplished. Yeah, I I love that you picked that quote. Um, yeah, yeah. There's been a, a a few photos where, like, I often feel lucky, and I know that you shouldn't, because a lot of it is like I've practiced really hard and I've, I've tried to master the camera and free diving and the art form. So it, it's not really luck. It's kind of where opportunity meets years of training, you know, but every once in a while you get a photo that exceeds what you thought you were capable of. Mm. And then, yeah, I think of, I think of my dad, it's kind of like, but that's, that also has to, a little bit to do with luck. Like, like the, the the light does something that you have no control over, and the athlete does something that you didn't direct them to do. Like it, it's it's such an intricate dance, isn't it? Like it's not, it's certainly not just me down there. It's I kind of tend to pick the background, but like what the athlete do, does, they do, and what the light does, it does. So. But most of the time when I'm working, I, 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 yeah, I'm almost like an extension of the camera. Mm. Like I, I just kind of on instinct know where I should be and what, like I, it, there's no rationale behind how I work and there's no pre-planned anything about how I work. Like even in the pool, like I was working with, I was at the pool world championships in Bulgaria last month and I was working with this Taiwanese athlete. And I never worked with her before. And she said, I've never posed on the water before. Mm. And she gets down to the bottom and she starts moving like a ballet dancer. And it's just gorgeous. But I like, we are down there for like a minute, minute and a half. And I end up in the weirdest positions just because like I follow the camera, like you follow the image and you see kind of like, oh, the frame needs to be here or it needs to be there. And like, there's not, I don't feel like I'm really in control of that. But maybe that's because I have some like enough control that I can let go of control. Mm. Paradoxically speaking, you know what I mean? Like I, yeah, like it doesn't feel like I'm in control because I, like I, I can do this kind of stuff. But like it is instinct that takes over, and yeah, sometimes you get, you get to that point where you kind of feel like I, that that's not, like I can't claim this one, you know. 
Yeah, something, no, I something took over. I I definitely believe in luck, but I think as you master a skill more and more, it's more of like you can get very lucky at the beginning of your career and get an opportunity or, you know, the universe aligns in a way where maybe you're performing above where someone may perform a year or two into a profession. But I also think there's a different type of luck that people don't really separate from just general luck, which is this level of professional happenstance that only occurs with mastery and you would only be in a position physically and intellectually and emotionally to capture that moment with a certain depth of knowledge and experience so the i I agree i agree with the the element of luck but i i also think there's there's levels to luck that once you get a certain you know whether it's the ten thousand hours or whatever it is like things start to happen where people attribute it to luck but it's also coming from this instinctual mastery and this is instinctual sort of experience that you're only able to pick up on to recognize as an opportunity whereas you know five years or ten years before that it wouldn't have even occurred to you to you know take that picture or do a dive in that particular way or or use a certain element of painting or, or whatever it is because you you didn't even know that that was a way you could do it yeah yeah that that's interesting like the more it seems like the more you train <laughs> the harder you work the luckier you get in a way yeah so yeah yeah it's not it's not really luck but I, it's like my dad said you like there there is an external factor there where you can't 100 percent claim something as yours and yeah so yeah luck is a way of describing it uh, but there's something fundamentally mysterious sometimes and, and especially on the water it may just it's just more mysterious there it yeah it's enhanced how annoying was it to get in philosophical arguments with your father like my my father was not a philosopher at all and it was still annoying to have him you know explain to me why something was wrong or his lack of explanation just telling me you know you fucked up and this is your punishment i couldn't imagine if my dad was trying to explain to me on a deep level why i am the one (laughs) at fault or or like what 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 was that like being a teenager with a guy who could just like put you in a stranglehold philosophically yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. to his credit he didn't do that much but uh just to let you know it was there he did it every once in a while just to like let you know the power like put you in a a chokehold or something no but you you, (laughs) no but you 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 knew like but like like he could oh like okay so if you break a plate or something by accident and he got a little bit pissed off with a god i mean and, and you go like oh i didn't mean to and he and he goes like yeah but that plate doesn't know that you didn't mean to <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my god <laughs> and, and now i know as an adult i kind of know like yeah but the plate probably also doesn't know that it's broken you know mm. so mm. but yeah so, <laughs> Like that's one of those things where, like, I often wish that he was still around. But like, like the the the, the whole question of intention. Like to my yeah. father, he, I think in in the end, intention didn't matter. Outcome mattered a bit, and I keep going. Yeah. Like, oh, but I, I find I want to have that this discussion with him. I I, I want to get deeper into that. I'm I'm not sure if intention matters or not, but that would be one of those areas where I'd find it interesting. But my dad was not one of those philosophers who talked about philosophy. He, he wrote and like mm. talking about it made him a little bit itchy, made him itchy. You know, it, it's like, it's, it, that was talking was not his medium. He w- mm. probably would not have enjoyed podcasts or that kind of stuff. Like he, he was very abrupt with interviewers as well. He didn't, he didn't like him much. Mm. 
you you could also I love it turn around his his reasoning on him like the you know if you break a plate the plate doesn't care you know it's not it's the the intention or lack of intention if your dad catches you smoking weed and he says you know like this is wrong this is a bad thing to do you could always say is it wrong or am I just entering a slice of reality that's uncomfortable for you and you perceive that as wrong? <laughs> and then you're just like getting into this whole uh, this whole argument. I, I don't know. I'm just projecting what I would say to my own dad, um, not necessarily how your dad yeah. would uh, react. I'm just thinking like if I got in these sort of philosophical arguments with my dad, like the gymnastics I would try to go through to to comfort my own ego and be like, no, I'm the one who's right. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the that's the thing like as i like before i lost him i was already kind of reconciling the fact that okay i'm, I'm like he's like that he's he's just got a, a great mind and i don't have a great mind so i'm like it would be wise of me to take into consideration that he's probably right and i'm probably wrong about this i'll still argue with him Mm. but it's the kind of arguments where you kind of go like uh, uh, yeah um like it's like he's an expert you know and mm. yeah, when it comes to experience like you, yeah your own experience yeah i don't i don't know i just i didn't have that kind of relationship with him like mo we, we got along really well most of the time because yeah. like we yeah we we like we accepted the limitations of our of our characters you know what mm -hmm. i mean like he like he is the way he is and i am the way i am and i love the i love the way he is and he loved the way i am yeah and, and that's you like the worst thing you can do to somebody is want them to be different you know mm. yeah yeah i, I you know I've, i'm not a parent and maybe i will be one day but i imagine that's an incredibly different uh d incredibly difficult thing to do is to raise your kid in the best way possible and at the same time not try to make them into someone you want them to be but just kind of give them space to develop in a fulfilling way and I, I know nothing yeah. what that's like, but I, I've, th I've started to think about that more and more as my parents get older, where like as much as I, you know, like everyone, you have things that you look back at on your childhood and you think, oh, like that was messed up or, you know, whatever. Uh, I wish this was different. My parents gave me enough of a free space to operate to where I was able to explore the things that I wanted to explore. And I never really felt like. I was being like kind of uh herded towards something like maybe with morals and stuff like that, but never a line of work or profession or something like that. It was always kind of like, let's see, let's see what he likes. And with my brothers too. And then if they mm -hmm. like it, you know, we'll, we'll give them what they need to explore that more. But I never felt like I was kind of like a cattle being like prodded towards a certain direction it's that same thing as we were talking about before isn't it it's the the being in the moment it's my mm. dad had that very strong with 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 everything as well it's like let it be what it is you know like he's one of his things with his philosophy that makes him very frustrating for most people who read him is that he, he doesn't try to give you an answer or anything he 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 kind of circles around things and he mm. describes things, but he does it's like, it's not like you feel a bit empty handed afterwards. Cause you kind of go like, okay, but I like, I, you don't go to my dad for guidance, you know, mm. like it's, he's not that kind of philosopher, but he does have an immense and innate respect for the things as they are. So that like, you know, <laughs> And he had the same with his kids. Like he didn't try to mold us into something that like would represent him. No, we're we are our own creatures. And like, yeah. he he just tried to like facilitate 
it facilitate our own way for us. You know, he helped me get to New York to study there. Yeah. Where I, I, I'm sure he would have preferred if I'd stick closer to him because then we could see each other more. But he knew that that was my dream to get to New York. So, like, he helped me do that. Mm. You know, he, he facilitated that, which is, a, like, as a parent, that's that's a really great thing yeah. to do, I think. Yeah. So, speaking of facilitation, um, and as, as we end off, th- there are a lot of billionaires right now who want to facilitate us to another to a multi-planetary existence so there's a lot of effort right now to find a way to get off of planet earth in expectation that obviously this is no longer going to be a habitable space one day and if humankind is going to exist we'll have to become a multi-planetary species as someone who spends a lot of time exploring in the opposite direction you know like while everyone else is looking up like you're going deeper and deeper into the place we already are what are your Hmm. thoughts on the recent like this billionaire uh obsession kind of like curiosity I, i i i don't know i just wanted to get your thoughts on this sort of space race privatized billionaire race to explore other planets and kind of get us off the ground on earth uh, as opposed to spending, you know, one or two billionaires out of the, you know, the 10 that are having their own space companies right now that could spend money to explore where we already are. Have you thought about that at all? And kind of like the, the, the recent phenomenon with the, the space races. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Cause there's an obvious, correlation between trying to like live in space and trying to live on the water you know um like a lot of nasa astronauts get trained underwater to be able to deal with like our gravity and everything up there and so i always find it interesting yeah that that they want to go out there and we have hardly explored what's down down here you know, I think it's like something like five percent or seven percent of the ocean's bottom has been explored. Yeah. So, like that, that that's barely that's barely a sparrow's fart. So, I mean, they're billionaires and they, they can they're free to do with their money as they please, of course. And but instead of instead of thinking like we need to get off of this planet can't they put some resources into going like we need to like take care of this planet Maybe. yeah yeah it, 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 I mean, it would be interesting it's kind that, of a nice planet to, it, it would be interesting uh to think that you know even if your goal as someone who's starting a rocket company would be to eventually leave this planet it would probably be in your best interest to explore the unexplored and the depths of the ocean, because like you said, that may help us survive better while we're here. And then also past the point to where we actually do get to that time where we're, you know, like clocks ticking, whatever, you know, 4 billion years from now, whenever it is, when we have to leave planet earth, it it seems like there's something, I don't know. It's it's weird to think about. Like, why why is there not the same urge to go deep as there is to go far, like outer space as there is to go into the depths of the ocean? Because some of the craziest shit I've ever seen, like photos that I would think came from outer space, actually come from miles deep in the ocean. Mm-hmm. So it's it's just uh, you know, maybe one or two billionaires will break off and start a space exploration or uh, an ocean exploration company, and they'll work together. Uh, put some of that crazy. Bezos money into the blue. Maybe. <laughs> blue Prime. Blue Ocean. Prime. There you go. Um, yeah. Ocean X. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it will be like a submarine in the in the shape of a penis, won't it? Maybe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Getting very wet. You know. It's, uh <laughs> going balls deep mm. wow balls uh. deep that that's uh, that's, a, that's a good tagline for ocean x should pitch that to elon musk yeah ocean x balls of, deep yeah and basis of 
Yeah. In Bezos' case, that is, that's at least three inches, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's maximum. That's maximum. Oh, man. That's average, right? Uh, 3.5? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's on the large well, side of average. Well, in the in the ne- in the Netherlands, you know, it's it's uh, the average uh, tends yeah, to well, be way higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did they say again? Knee length. Knee length. Yeah, from your from your knees to your toes. That's how you estimate the length of your member. Next so, like two two yeah, two and a half feet, something like that. Yeah. Nice. Um. <laughs> Why does it always, always end up with that kind of topic with me? Yes. Well, I'm glad. Uh, I'm, I'm glad this will. It, it will be a a full circle with going, you know, deep into the ocean and then going balls deep into another type of ocean, and then we can wrap it all, wrap it all together in a full deep diving, oh. uh, deep context, coming full circle. Oh, I was doing so well. It was doing so well, and then yeah, it's oh, well. it's still going well. Let let me uh let me de <laughs> let me derail it by asking you a question that's impossible to answer as we end off. This will be um right forty two. Yes, <laughs> there we go. Um, no. <laughs> that 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 may be the answer. We'll see. So okay, with as with as much as you've experienced bored darkness and the unknown and you spend a lot of time in states that people the average person is afraid to to push that level of uncomfortability that we talk about people associate that with death or dying even though that as you've explained that you're not actually dying like that feeling of breathing is not indicative of losing your life in any way or getting closer to death but like Mm. what what is your what is your best guess as to what lies after we die like what 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 comes after has has exploring the unknown given you any sort of inkling into what you think could come after death what what is what is your deepest belief into the thing that happens when we cease consciousness um so in free diving there's a thing called a blackout where if you hold your breath for a little bit too long your consciousness says you know it says bye bye mm. um so you don't die you just you black out um and it doesn't hurt it's just like you you wake up from it and you have like a little bit of a memory lapse. So you don't know what happened the last, let's say five seconds or 10 seconds of your dive. And, and then you're awake again and like everything is back to normal, except for the fact that like somebody's holding you and, (laughs) and you know, Mm. you're at the surface and you don't remember getting there, which is like a baby. Um, You're like going back to being a baby. uh, no but that blackout thing like i don't remember not being there Mm. like at a certain point i i just kind of was and by that point i was already me so i reckon if i die i just it's going to be like a blackout it's I'm, i'm no longer there um like an eternal blackout and i'm yeah, and I'm fine with that. I'm like I like the idea of reincarnation and karma and that kind of stuff. I, I I find that very interesting. But to me, from what I've seen on the water, like there's so many fish and so many variations of fish that life seems to want to have everything exist as much as it can. Mm. Every possibility wants wants to exist, and once it has existed, that seems to be okay. Like, and that's fine by me. Like, it's it, if if this is it, this is 
gigantic, beautiful, heartwarming gift. Like, I don't need to be there to be anything else. And I completely understand people who kind of like, they miss their parents so or they miss their loved ones so much that they want there to be a heaven or they want to see them again. Like, of course. Mm. But in my heart of hearts, I, I've added my thing to the diversity and I've added my thing to um, to the quantity and the quality of life. And then once it's done, it's 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 done. And I'm I'm fine with that. Like that seems to be more than I could ever have asked for. So Yeah. I I I think yeah, a big blackout and that's that's fine. Yeah, go- going back to the curiosity, if nature is curious, if whatever force is holding together this universe is curious and it must be because there's so much evolution, there's so much change. It's not that hmm. it would be uh, wrong to have humans die and, and not come back or, or animals die and not come back. It's that it would be boring. Like maybe death is more because <laughs> m- maybe because nature is so m- death isn't out of any sort of necessity. It's like nature expressing its curiosity. Like this was a fun creation, but like now I'm on yeah. to the next thing. You get you had your time, and if I'm going to stay curious and keep this world going, then there needs to be the 2.0 and 3.0, and it'll just go as long as mm, yeah. the forces of the universe will allow it. Yeah, the 14.7 billion point oh. Um, the counter argument there, of course, is that part of diversity is a certain, there is there has to be a concert, conservative element to it. Because if you mm. want diversity, you also want to keep the, the original. You know, yeah. you want all the variations of the original, but the original as well, because that adds to the uh, diversity. So there has to be purely logically speaking uh a conservative element there so yeah maybe there will be a done maybe i am done 18.4 billion and there'll be another one hopefully he'll he'll have like a better sense of humor (laughs) (laughs) but (laughs) and a better set of bowels you know Maybe. Yeah, but that that you know that <laughs> a that, less that ridiculously tall that uh that keeps it interesting, you know. I uh I think you have a great sense of humor, and uh you know if, if you could shit yourself at any time during a podcast or a free dive, like that's only uh that's only making the the outcome uh, too late more out here. Oh, there you go. I I mean the second time or the third time. Um, but yeah, that's it's that's a good point. In order to have the <laughs> the diversity, in order to have the the uh the excitement of the differences within the spectrum you need that original to contrast it like the prototype so it may yeah i i have no Mm. idea i i tend to think uh in line with what you said with the eternal blackout which is what happens after we die. I, and I forget the who said this quote or what the exact quote was but it's something along the lines of being dead is what it's like before we were born which is like you don't know that you don't know like there's no uh consciousness it, it doesn't hurt it doesn't not hurt it's just like you're just a a nothing that is not in existence and you don't know that you are in existence before you're born just like it'll be that way after we die. It's just kind of like this fade off. And um, I yeah. would, I, if I had to guess, I would say it's something like that. Being dead is like what it's like, you know, afterlife is similar to what it's like before. Yeah. There is something quite wondrous and curious though. Like I've seen regretfully or maybe thankfully, I don't know, but I've seen death a couple of times now. And there is this, is is this free diving or is this just passing? Well, passing I saw my on? father. I saw my father die. I saw my father die, and I saw 
okay but you there it is a process and the weird thing is like before this process the person is there and after the process the body is there but the person is not there mm. and it's unmistakable and it's very strange i have but it's one of those things where like i'm i'm fine with it being a mystery and I'm a little bit curious to find out, but I don't want to find out anytime soon. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm, and maybe yeah. there's nothing to find out because, you know, by that by that point you're dead and there's like you don't function anymore. And maybe you do. I don't know. It's an interesting mystery, but like maybe in 60, 70 years I'm I'm willing to to take that leap. But yeah. Right now I'm enjoying the other state way too much. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we're not done trying to be interesting yet. So nature keeps us around and then as soon as we get too boring it'll pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> but we create so much so many so much so many things. Like yeah. fish create a lot of other fish which is lovely as well. Mm. But we create like all the like humans are f incredible. Like all these things that we're creating, uh, uh, art we, and submarines and space rockets and songs yeah. and podcasts and wow, yeah, yeah. We we create movies. We create a uh, blockbuster movies with fish and three D printers. Three <laughs> D printers that will eventually be able to print fish. So it's it's uh, you know it's wild to to think yeah. about. But but uh, thank you thank you so much, Dan, for being extremely generous with your time you know two hours and 20 minutes flew it's by I, I looked down at around an hour and it. 15 minutes and um that, that's always a sign of a great conversation that it, it flows by and where wh was, where's the best place for people to follow your work i know you have youtube instagram and i'll link everything that you say in the wherever you're listening or watching this podcast, please go check out Dan's work. I'll also mention it in the intro as well, but where's the best place for people to follow you? Um, I'd say YouTube is my most important one because that one pays the bills. Mm, um, there you go. But yeah, there's Instagram, there's, there's, there's Facebook. Um, if you're so inclined, I have a website, but I don't do much with it, but that there's a couple of pictures there which I like. Um, but yeah, YouTube. Check out my YouTube. Yes, go check out the YouTube. I promise you, you will develop an addiction for watching people hold their breath and go free diving in all sorts of fascinating places across the world. It is, uh, you know, quite literally uh, addicting and hard to not watch the next one. And that's why I think it'll eventually become more of a like a i'm convinced that there's entertainment value there that's not being tapped into apart from just all the physical and psychological benefits like it is truly amazing to watch your videos and your film photography and and thank you again for taking the time to to come on the show my pleasure zach it was a joy